Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for attending our latest uh, webinar for orthopedic specialists. Um, as you know, we host these on a fortnightly basis, and each week we get one of our expert surgeons to come and uh, give a talk about their area of interest. Um, and th thanks again for, for attending uh, tonight. It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce my uh, good friend and colleague, um, Dr. Christian Clay. And we're just going to be talking about um, and management of hips. Um, I'm just going to get onto my first slide. So, great. So, tonight's talk is going to be about modern pathways in hip osteoarthritis, when to refer, treatment options, and latest minimally invasive surgery. Um, it's going to be uh, given by uh, Dr. Christian Clay, who's uh, part of orthopedic specialists. Um, and a part of the team with myself and Professor Adrian Wilson. Um, and Adrian's also going to be joining us on the panel this evening. Um, Christian, for those of you who have not come across him before, um, is a globally right, renowned... You can't see a slide. Oh, sorry. I'll try again. Apologies. Got it. So, Got it. so just Got it. go back again. So... Um, so th that's the area, uh, that's the topic uh, we're going to be going through today. And uh, so this is Christian, uh, he's, he, as I was just saying earlier, he's a globally renowned authority in both hip and knee surgery. Uh, and the focus for today is going to be around hips. But um, he's well known for, for both areas and particularly has a passion for joint uh, preservation. And is a part of our team at the London Osteotomy Centre, uh, together with myself, Adrian and uh, Ronald Van Heerwarden. He um, performs minimally invasive and muscle sparing techniques, which he's going to go into uh, detail today. Um, he's truly an innovator. Um, he develops lots of his own um, materials and uh, techniques and goes and travels around the world lecturing on those uh, particular techniques. So we're really privileged to have him as part of our team. And he's one of uh, a group of surgeons that, that cover all aspects of orthopedic surgery. Uh, ranging from hip and knee, spine, paediatrics, hands, foot and ankle, um, uh, through to pain management. So we've got a, quite a comprehensive team with leading experts from around the world, uh, all coming to London to offer these services uh, to our patients. We do our consultations both out of the London Clinic and Harley Street Specialist Hospital. And this is our, um, this is our hospital on Queen Anne Street, uh, where we do a lot of our consultations. And um, as many of you know, uh, we're closely affiliated to the London Clinic. And many thanks to them again for their ongoing support um, in supporting these webinars. So the topics are going to be going through today in managing hip arthritis, the sort of stepwise fashion in doing so, uh, the treatment options and the surgical techniques, and why Christian's technique is, is different uh, to those you would have come across before. Following this, um, if you could kindly fill in a questionnaire, which will follow um, uh, tomorrow, uh, you'll be awarded two CPD points, which have been awarded by the Royal College of Surgeons. If you want to keep up to date with um, all our um, uh, movements and um, procedures that we're doing and the exciting, exciting innovations that uh, Christian and Adrian are, are, are producing, please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. These are our handles. And if there are patients you would like us to have a look at or come see us in theatre or discuss cases as, a, as part of an MDT, uh, we're available on contact on, these, um, on this email address, telephone number, and you can find these details on our web address. I'll be putting this slide up at the end also for you to have a look at um, at the end of the talk. Just a couple of house points, uh, house rules. So if you please have any questions, we really uh, encourage questions during the talk. So please put them um, to us and both myself and Adrian will put them to Christian at the end of the talk um, so we really encourage that. Uh, just before I hand over to Adrian um, I'd just like you to know about our London Osteotomy Masterclass uh, which we're uh, doing uh, which we're having in March next year. It's going to be at Lord's, it's going to be a hybrid uh, conference both something you can attend in person but also attend online um, and it will be going through all the um, uh, exciting developments in joint preservation surgery. And um, we've got a stellar lineup from all around the world attending. So we'd really like to welcome you to that and we'll give you the details on how to register for that event. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Adrian. I'll stop sharing my screen. Adrian, over to you. Uh, thanks, Rags. A great intro. And um, 
thank you for, for 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 setting this all up. I think these educational webinars have been have been really stellar. I mean, we've done a lot of teaching over the last uh, few months uh, using this sort of forum, and I think it's uh, it, it's obviously the way of the future. And thanks to the uh, attendees for attending, and also to Christian for giving up time. I know you were working till the early hours polishing your talk as you WhatsApp me at one twenty this morning. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the talk. I mean, for, for us, uh, we're very lucky to have Christian as part of our group. Christian and I have known each other for um, uh, over a decade and uh, we came together because of our love of innovation. Uh, we're always um, thinking about how we can do things differently. Uh, we've done a lot of great work together in the field of knee preservation and osteotomy. Uh, and in the last six months, we've had some real massive breakthroughs, uh, things that we're really proud of that we've done together uh, for that particular operation um, that, uh, that are globally accepted uh, as in terms of uh, the technique. On a personal level, uh, aged, uh, well, I'm 52 now, but uh, uh, for a few years, I developed stiffness in my hip, my right hip. It wasn't really bothering me too much. And then it became really very painful over a period of approximately a year and a half. I managed it with injections and uh, tried microfragmented fat, which helped. Um, but eventually, it got to the point where the stiffness and the discomfort would, were really uh, making it difficult for me to remain active. I have a young family and we have a very physical job. So it became clear from the x-rays that the arthritis that I had, uh, which was, you know, bone on bone, grade four arthritis, that um, the way to go was for a hip replacement. So then who do you choose? And the you know, people really uh, focus on what type of prosthesis am I going to have, which is an important part of the equation, but really uh, what you want for your uh, for your orthopedic procedure is to choose the surgeon. So although we're very, very close friends um, uh, and we speak every single day and my wife thought I was completely bonkers, I said, I I'm going to entrust my hip to Christian uh, and I'm going to fly to Hanover because he hadn't quite started working in the UK. So I went over with my wife just before Christmas last year on December the 9th and uh, when they took my blood pressure, uh, it, my, my blood pressure reading was something ridiculous, like 230 over, over 140. It was, everyone was laughing and it was, I was fairly nervous about the whole thing. Um, and I went and had two, it was the Christmas markets where I had two glue vines, which calmed me down. And then we actually had a few glasses of wine that night. And my wife said, you know, for God's sake, you know, it's 11 o'clock, shouldn't you all be in bed? You know, you, he's operating on you at seven in the morning. So anyway, we, he promised me that he would take his time. Christian uh, takes uh, 20 minutes and uh, 20 seconds to do a uh, hip replacement. Uh, he took 28 minutes to do my hip replacement. And he was working with Philip Lobenhofer as the assistant. And Philip said he literally preserved every single muscle fiber. All the retractors were so carefully uh, positioned. And um, yeah, it was exactly what I was hoping for. So because of this novel approach that he has and, and the speed which, with which he can do the surgery, I had no pain after the surgery other than a dull ache for a few days. I didn't really ever require crutches. Um, I was driving my car. We had an anniversary, my wife and I, a week after the surgery, and I felt confident enough to drive my car. And we went for dinner, and um, and Christy and I did an operating list almost four weeks to the day. It was four weeks and two days, and Rags, myself, and Christy all operated together at the London Clinic, and I think we did nine cases. And I, you know, I wasn't jumping around at that point, but I, I, you know, I was fairly comfortable, comfortable enough to do a day's work. And so I, I think this is a really a, a fantastic way in which to carry out hip surgery. I've, I've assisted with lots now, and I'm, I'm his glamorous assistant when he comes and he operates in the UK as his rags. And uh, it's amazing to watch the approach, to see him, to see him do the procedure. Um, and I'm, I'm you know, just very glad that I chose him. So Christian, I'm now going to hand over to you to tell us why the OCM Rottinger approach is the way to go. He said to me, actually, for just one final thing. He said, Adrian, I know we love osteotomy and I know that's our thing. And I know that's what we're really famous for. But the thing that's really going to make a difference for us as a group is this hip approach, because it's by far the best thing that we now do as a, as a trio, because it's just such an outstanding way of carrying out the procedure and what he can't understand is why everyone's not doing it so tell us why why christian why is everyone not doing it over to you uh... perfect so uh can can everyone hear me perfect so thanks for your uh introduction uh 
thanks Rex obviously for the uh, for the presentation and Adrian for the for the story around it. Um, obviously, yes, I, I was sitting uh, till quite late yesterday, uh, not complaining, just to remind you um, when Adrian said 1.20 in the morning, uh, that is uh, 2.20 continental time. So uh, a, as a matter of fact, that, that was quite long, but I just had no time of the day. So um, yeah, yeah, hip replacement. That's the the task for today to um, well basically basically explain you why we do it the way we do it or why I do it the way I do it, and uh, well some of uh, some of the remarks Adrian said I just cannot uh, take for myself. Um, I was not the one though we pioneer lots of things. Uh, I was not the one who pioneered this. Um, uh, uh, I was not the one who pioneered this. That was a, a, um, Herr Röttinger, Mr. Röttinger. Can everyone see my screen right now? Yes, we can. We can. Yeah, we just, can. just okay. uh, click. Uh, slide Usually, there. there should be a green, some some kind of a green uh, line around it. You're good. We can see it. Perfect. Perfect. So I was just disturbed because I, I don't see that green line. So if you now see my screen, I'm happy enough. Good. So. Um, as I said, it was it was Röttinger who basically uh, basically described that uh, modern uh, pathway, as we call that. And um, uh, well, there is uh, there is some little things that you may feel uh, known or that you remember when you have done uh, lots of of hips or have seen some hip approaches. Um, at least uh, in continental Europe or Germany, uh, Austria, some other countries, we are trained to um, to perform our hips through a hardened approach, or in Germany we call that Bauer. And uh, the assistant of the Bauer approach basically stands at the same position as the lead surgeon uh, of an OCM approach. So therefore, um, you don't really have to change uh, the the aspect and the and the position of you what you what you see there all seems uh, very familiar but anyhow uh, I don't want to start directly with hip uh, replacement as hip replacement is one and the most important part of the talk obviously but it's just one part so let's start off with as we usually present to you some knee stuff let's start off with a little bit of anatomy and that's important so the hip joint itself is obviously, as uh, everyone knows, a ball and socket joint. And a ball and socket joint works, uh, works absolutely different from the knee joint, uh, where you have a combination of multiple, um, uh, multiple condyles and, and parts that go together. What you see here is basically a very, very precise fit of a ball that fits into a socket. And whenever, whenever this uh, function is kind of disturbed, then you have uh, the phenomenon that the neck or some deteriorated parts um, hit against each other or the neck hits against the, the labrum and that causes further damage because what you then have, if you once lose this so-called perfect precise movement, what we call containment of the hip. So if the hip loses its containment, well then it starts to act like a rocking horse and uh, you have a coup and a contre coup. So a hit and a counter hit on the contralateral side that causes destruction and all these reactions in terms of osteophytic growth and so what you know. So let's look at this hip uh, um, capsule that you've just seen, a uh, couple of strong ligaments around the hip that basically uh, restrict uh, the range of motion and uh, development of an osteoarthritis. So this is one big factor of, uh, of osteoarthritis, apart from the destruction and the pain that you have from the bone marrow edema and the synovitis. But you have some, some leading muscles around the hip and here you can see um, uh, the gluteus medius, minimus and maximus. And most important, uh, when you see that, um, when, you, when you walk, so for gait, is uh, the stabilization of the contralateral side of the hip um, for the walking phase. It's not the stance phase. You need to get the other leg walking. And so therefore, you need to lift up the contralateral hip. And that's done by the, um, let me jump there again, by the gluteus medius. So this one is the most important muscle 
for your uh, for your proper gait. In, if you lose this muscle function from the gluteus medius, you develop something that we call a Trendelenburg gait. And this Trendelenburg is just because you cannot abduct the hip anymore, and the loss of abduction leads to a lowering of the contralateral hip, and so therefore you cannot really properly walk. So this limping then is basically induced um, by, by the loss of function of the gluteus medius. And so therefore, we need to take a very close look at the gluteus medius. And uh, well, I come back later to that um, when we speak about the approach itself. So osteoarthritis of the hip. Well, uh, everyone seems to have osteoarthritis of the hip. Adrian, you're not alone, buddy. It's, it's lots of people. And uh, I will show you how, how many in fact. So this is how osteoarthritis of the hip looks like. So the left one, as you see, is completely deteriorated. You have all the changes that we know. Uh, so loss of joint space, um, uh, cysts, um, exophytes, and on the X-ray you would see uh, a sub, uh, sub, uh, subchondral sclerosis. So all these four um, signs basically show you uh, that there is an osteoarthritis uh, of the hip and the more severe it is, the more uh, you find all these four categories. So on the other side, on the right one, obviously you see here a pristine hip. So, um, and that does mean that here, uh, femur and acetabulum are covered with cartilage. And on the other side, wear and tear reduces this cartilage, destroying this shock absorber, and therefore leads to further problems like synovitis, bone marrow edema. Where what basically is what is painful because the, just the, the loss of cartilage doesn't lead to any pain as cartilage carries no nerve fibers. So um, as I said, 2.5 million people um, in England almost have osteoarthritis uh, of the hip, Adrian. Th these are all the data that I looked up yesterday evening. So this is uh, because I've, I've had this lecture basically in German language and therefore the, the figures are different, but um, uh, the percentage is the same. So it's 11%, sometimes you see uh, 10, sometimes 14, up to 14% of the population above 45 years. And that goes up to 20% uh, at the age of 70. So every fifth uh, uh, individual at the age of 70 has hip osteoarthritis. But not everyone obviously suffers at the same level. But when they suffer, it leads to pain, as we said. Adrian perfectly introduced by his own story uh, that you have stiffness, reduced mobility and function. So all that uh, can be seen in mostly all the patients. So reasons for an osteoarthritis development in the hip is first mechanical. That's quite often the case. And that is when you, for example, have an femoral acetabular impingement or hip dysplasia. So, uh, Thankfully, we can say that at least in Germany, I don't know when, when, uh, when that was introduced in the UK, but we have um, an obligatory uh, uh, sonography of the hip um, at day two in, uh, in newborns in Germany. So this is uh, the first um, thing we try to uh, detect dysplasia because obviously you can treat dysplasia of the hip and therefore, um, the dysplasia osteoarthritis rates were dropping, um, but there is other things like uh, perfusion problems, uh, primary inflammatory like in rheumatoid arthritis and uh, post-trauma obviously, but many, many others more reasons that lead to osteoarthritis of the hip. So uh, the symptoms of an osteoarthritis of the hip, we were talking about that limping, stiffness, limited range of motion, activities of daily living uh, find their limitations and you have quite some groin pain. Uh, that is the key symptom that leads the surgeon to, uh, to hip osteoarthritis. When patients come to you, I have that in all my outpatient clinics, usually patients come and say, I have problems with my hip and then they point on their back. So most of, of these uh, patients have problems with their sciatic nerve and therefore rather uh, vertebrigenal problems. So groin pain is really key. And obviously that all leads to some kind of social isolation because uh, when, you, when you cannot walk any further than 100 meters, you don't go to a museum, you don't go to a cinema and uh, that even in non-COVID times. So, um, 
Diagnostics. Uh, well, obviously, you speak to your patients. Very important to have a, have a proper epicrisis. You need to have proper uh, proper chart for that. So uh, clinical findings. Um, then the examination. Uh, what you see is uh, that stiffness. So mostly in 90 degrees of flexion, there is uh, there is uh, almost no in a severe case almost no internal rotation of the hip anymore. In most of the patients with severe osteoarthritis, that even um, goes to spontaneous um, 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 outer rotation of the uh, of the hip. So uh, that's very important to check that. Uh, things like uh, leg length discrepancy obviously need to be measured and uh, then you go for your imaging. And uh, here I find it very interesting that uh, patients are often sent to us uh, with MRI scans, which is a very good thing, obviously, but for severe osteoarthritis of, of the hip, we did an x-ray, a simple and plain deep pelvic view. Uh, um, so an x-ray is all we need, actually. And on an x-ray, you have a, a perfect option to diagnose full thickness defect um, of the hip joint. So now, on our way to uh, full thickness defects, the question now might be, is now osteoarthritis of the hip preventable? And that would be great because as you know, from our knee practice, this is what we all try to do. Basically, we try to avoid arthroplasty by doing tricky things like changing uh, the, the load weight bearing whatsoever. We do osteotomies. And obviously there is things like osteotomies around the hip as well. But these techniques more and more have been kind of uh, been as, as a knee surgery forgotten due to the tremendous success of, uh, of, of hip arthroplasty, but some other options came along. Because today, um, I would say it's more preventable than probably 10 years ago, but that has more to do with the knowledge about femoral acetabular impingement that you can treat either mini open or arthroscopically um, than with the prevention of the disease itself. So. A femoral acetabular impingement actually um, can be described uh, as either a chem, which is uh, some, some bony growth onto the neck of the femur, or a pincer, which is a bony enlargement of the labral area of the acetabulum. And uh, these may lead um, to, these, to these hits that I've described, to a coup and a contre-coup that leads to further deterioration due to the distorted mechanism of a central guided hip joint ball and socket function because the center of rotation changes when you have an impingement. So these can be individualized pins or cam impingements or obviously there is combined impingements and you can treat those uh, and we do this today either mini open or arthroscopically as described but it's very interesting that only 20% of these FAI patients really develop an osteoarthritis. And there is good data uh, today uh, that that's the case. So most of these patients would never go into full thickness osteoarthritis over a duration of at least 25 years. And um, here's another uh, good study that I found just recently reduced in 2018. And uh, that is from the Danish hip arthroscopy registry and they basically recorded all of their uh, of their hips and looked uh, for risk factors or outcome uh, outcome data uh, regards um, hip arthroscopy and FAI treatments so and they uh, detected that there is two major factors that basically deliver bad and poor outcome um, when you um, when you go for FAI treatment so one is uh, age. Above the age of 25, you have quite a high likelihood of developing uh, or having a poor result. And one is a degree of osteoarthritis. So the more progressed the osteoarthritis, and we all know that from knee uh, arthroscopy, the more progressed the osteoarthritis, um, um, the lesser uh, it makes sense to really scope it. So yes, you can change something, uh, but sometimes I, I really doubt that it makes sense. And that's somewhat uh, for, for some other reason. 
looking at these figures, this is what I've just found on the internet as an example for femoral acetabular impingement. And when you look on this black arrow pointing on this, uh, on this uh, cam on the femoral neck, the problem with this cam is that it's basically not a generic cam. It's a reaction of osteoarthritis. So this is rather an osteophyte grown to the femoral neck and you see the defect uh, as far as the, uh, as, the, um, um, as the joint space is concerned. You see that the, the femoral head is not really quite round anymore. So often, often uh, an initial or quite progressed osteoarthritis is misinterpreted as a femoral acetabular impingement. And when you treat it then as a femoral acetabular impingement, knowing that the progressed osteoarthritis is a bad indicator for that, then it's quite obvious that the results are going to be poor. So, but we have also conservative treatment options, obviously. And um, uh, I'm not going to do any talk here or lecture on, on physiotherapy because, it, I mean, if there are physiotherapists around, they can do that way better than I do, obviously, and um, it's, it's not my daily practice. But when we go for conservative treatment um, as surgeons, then we uh, first attend speak about medication. And what we use there in osteoarthritis of the hip, and Adrian has his knowledge with that, is non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And uh, if it if it's really severe, then we go for opioids. Sometimes a combination of that. And then it's very important uh, to keep your exercising. So um, the hip joint is, is, uh, is a strange one. So the neutropition of cartilage actually comes from, comes from uh, the synovial fluid uh, that has to be convected. And you're gonna do this and achieve it by, by keep moving. And uh, the only secret is that it has to be uh, with restricted weight because when you move under full load, then it causes destruction and pain. So that's why most hip osteoarthritis patients tell you that, well, I can cycle great. Cycling is a great sport for me. I can do swimming, but I cannot do any running. So um, maintenance of exercise is very important and you need to kind of tailor your activities. So um, if you bring down the level of impact on an osteoarthritic uh, hip, that also gives you relief of pain and brings you further. But there's then obviously more invasive treatments. And as these invasive treatments also kind of have a hierarchy uh, of, of treatment pathways, there is one thing which I like to announce here today, and that's, uh, and Adrian said it already because he added himself is something like cell therapy or stroma cell therapy or adipose tissue. So obviously there is modern pathways today uh, that haven't been really taken into consideration. And here you see some uh, two very, very active guys in that field. Um, and obviously you're more than welcome to, uh, to look at what the regenerative is done and uh, about the treatment options we have there in modern very minimally invasive aspects of osteoarthritis treatment. Then we have something that we were pointing out already. And as I said, it's rather for patients with not so, uh, but there is joint uh, preserving uh, treatments when you detect. Um, can you hear me now? It points that my internet connection is unstable. Okay, perfect. So arthroscopy or mini open techniques in order to treat uh, femoral acetabular impingement. And we are very lucky that we have another really superstar uh, uh, in that field. Tony Andrade is working with us in, in uh, orth uh, orthopedic specialists. Uh, let's, let me say commune. This is rather really a, a very, very uh, uh, interesting uh, gathering point of, of surgeons that have really one goal and one interest to just uh, make treatment better. And then there is obviously joint replacement. So uh, total hip arthroplasty, as you see here, and that's Adrian after his total hip arthroplasty, uh, the day after actually um, uh, we went to do his x-rays and you see his x-rays there. So what is hip arthroplasty all about? So. First, let me come to the history of total hip arthroplasty. So there is resection arthroplasty, and that was uh, performed in 1820s, and Girdlestone, the name is still given to a resection arthroplasty of the hip, 
1940. So you see that this is all performed before the times where we really had proper options to do joint replacements. But obviously people had osteoarthritis of the hip and there was a need for treatment. So uh, our, our forefathers and, and foremothers, um, they really tried to improve it and, um, and came up with uh, different materials, designs, and so on and so on. And there was Theophistus Gluck in the German area was one of the first ones to uh, really come up with hip and, and knee joints. But we have ivory implants from grooves uh, from 1922. Obviously, they didn't last long because ivory is not really um, the material you would go for. It doesn't really fit to bone. Um, and so uh, we, we had other developments like uh, interpositions of glass or later acrylic glass or bakelite interpositions. And then since 1938, uh, uh, we had uh, chrome, uh, cobalt, molybden, um, uh, as you can see here, some cups that were just placed on to act as an interposition on the resected or partially resected uh, femoral head, working as some kind of a gliding partner to the acetabular cup. So in 1950, then, uh, um, Judea had a femoral stem uh, implant out of acrylic glass, and that was really the first stem implant, but still not a a complete uh, joint arthroplasty or a total hip. And this is where the name total hip comes from. So you see, this is a partial hip. Uh, that's often asked by patients, do I get a, a partial or a total hip? So, and unless we want to go back to the times of JD, uh, people should have a total hip replacement. So, and, and the first one was actually introduced by McKee and uh, uh, Watson Farrar in uh, 53. And uh, well, that's himself, McKee, and this is how it looked like. So rather looks like a water mine, and, but the, the other part already really like a modern uh, monoblock stem. So quite a sophisticated thing, and it worked quite well, apart from the fact that the bony, uh, the bony interface was not really made up well, and so the loosening rate was quite high. So, and this is when then Sir later announced uh, uh, John Charnley came up and introduced uh, uh, polymet uh, uh, acrylic cement and uh, normal bone cement into hip arthroplasty and uh, used polyethylene liners. And this is what he did. And actually, um, that was a, a masterpiece and groundbreaking uh, work because that is still what we do today. So since Sir John Charnley, the basics and the ideas and principles of total hip arthroplasty remain unchanged. Obviously, since his masterpiece in work, uh, low friction arthroplasty, uh, we have further developments. Um, thankfully, in terms of tribology, which, which is the, the knowledge of wear and tear inside of mechanical constructs, and so therefore a joint as well, we have improvements in material, biomechanics, and surgical technique. And so I want to emphasize a little bit the surgical technique, which is, as you see, just one tiny part of the whole thing. So let's look at the approaches that we have to the hip. And there is classic approaches from anterior, uh, described in 49, anterolateral, 36. You see that is way before total hip arthroplasty. So all what we say today, what kind of approach have you chosen, smith Peterson or Watson-Jones? Well, that was described way earlier than the arthroplasty itself. We just refer to these approaches today and make use of them. So all these approaches have been described, but they are modified at a later date to really um, ease the procedure and get it further. There is even transtrochanteric lateral uh, from, from Charnley described muscle splitting, as I said, Hardinge and Bauer, and uh, posterolateral lateral uh, approaches. So you can go to the hip from every way. Um, many ways lead to Rome, we say. Sometimes it's uh, just in contrary directions. But uh, there is one thing which is, uh, which, which is all the same. So all classic hip approaches imply more or less muscle detachment and that, or even bony cuts. So, and, and that's very important because modern modifications, and that is what uh, minimally invasive surgery is all about, bring these 
old approaches that we have into a more or less soft tissue sparing or even non-touching the muscles at all uh, environment. And this is what we call minimally invasive surgery. So it's not the length of the incision really that counts. It's what's happening underneath. Because what we want to preserve is the muscle fibers, uh, the engine of the hip that carries the patient later. And I've shown you how important the function uh, of gluteus medius is uh, if you want to go back to propagate. So demands for a uh, minimally invasive approach are now complete visualization. Well, it's not allowed to see fewer just because you cut shorter or try to damage fewer. You want to preserve these muscles, as we said, but you also need to be very sure about neurovascular structures. And you need a safe orientation and some space not to only put in the implants, but also to work inside in a safe way. So now let's look how the Rettinger OCM approach deals with all that. So looking at that, now that's um, a, a transverse cut through the hip joint. And what you see here at the very front of the blue line, so right to the blue line, I don't see if you, I don't know if you see my cursor, but uh, on the, on the, okay, so perfect. So what you see is, the TFL, the tensor fascia lata, you see that here, and that's the gluteus. So in, in between these muscles, you go inside. Whereas when you take a direct anterior approach, you come from here. All the other approaches coming from either posterior or transgluteal or trachanteric approaches are either, um, they either demand a cut uh, of the bone or a saw cut of the bone, or you go directly through the muscle and you have to re, uh, uh, reattach them after your deattachment. And if they function or if they heal or grow in there, well, that's not, not in your hands as a surgeon. The problem is we can only propagate it, the healing, by getting it morphologically right. But we don't do the healing. So you better not cut off the muscle if you don't have to. So very important now, if you look to the front here at the femoral side, you have the femoral nerve and, uh, and uh, the vessels. And here you have the sciatic nerve. And whenever you come from the front or from the back, you come very close to these. So the Rettinger approach comes from here. And that's the furthest away from all approaches from the neurovascular structures. So it's by far the safest approach I know. So looking now at that, it's an interval between gluteus medius and TFL, as I've shown you. And there is no division of any muscle or tendon. Um, you have a perfect visualization uh, of, the, of the acetabulum. And um, in fact, that's the only, I go back a couple of steps. If you look for the orientation of the acetabulum and see where that points to, then actually, if you come from here, you have the straightest view on the acetabulum. And that's what you need because the acetabular cup is the heaviest, the really uh, most difficult thing to place in an appropriate orientation. And that's key for a perfect function of the hip. So um, the incision is not that long, but I always say that's, that's not really my aim. Uh, if, if it deserves a longer cut for obese patients or very muscular patients, then I, I, I uh, just, um, just extend my approach. Um, the posterior capsule in the Rettinger approach remains intact, and that uh, carries a very low risk or brings a very low risk of dislocation. And in fact, I've never had one since I'm doing this approach for now eight years, and I do a couple of hundreds every year. So it's extensile, as I said. I don't mind to extend it. And, um, well, you can transfer it into a full Watson-Jones exposure. And this is what we all know. The approach was described some 50 years ago, and uh, well, now 70 years ago. And therefore, it makes it easy for all the guys being in hip surgery. And obviously, if you are a hip surgeon and want to perform hip arthroplasty, then you should be aware uh, and should be a hip surgeon. So Watson-Jones is something that you have been taught. Um, it's quite an acceptable learning curve. It doesn't really take too long. I guess anterior approaches really take a little longer. And as I already mentioned, the lateral positioning and, this, and the, the aspect that you have to it, as long as you start with hard and job hour, 
is quite easy. And due to the due to the space that you have in between neuro and neurovascular structures, and your approach is quite clear of neurovascular hazards. So the the sheer beauty about this thing is that it's one of the most i mean we as we said we try to bring every surgery to a very structured very comprehensive approach and be uh, be very straightforward we do every time the same but here uh, it it was not us who designed that it was already there so Rettinger made a great job in doing what we do for osteotomies for the hip so it's five leg positions he described and one is for the skin and capsular incision. The second is for the transcapsular neck cut. The third is the definitive neck cut. Then you go for the acetabulum and then for the femur. And that is all being brought into that chart. So if you look to the very top uh, of, the, of this chart, you see the positions of the assistants. You see the, um, uh, the nurse, the, the scrub nurse, the surgeon himself, and the anesthetist. So everything is basically very structured and has its order and then by force you have to come from here to there you go to there do your femoral cut um do your definitive osteotomy of the uh, of the femur um put the femur back uh, in order to get access to the acetabulum and then you bring the femur back to that position actually in order to get access to that so it's a very structured thing and that's it so let's go through such a procedure and i um I speeded that up as you see. Well, it doesn't take long anyhow because it's that structured. That is now the incision. As you see, it's some eight centimeters till 10, I would say. And you go from the, uh, from the uh, greater troke in direction to the, to the SIAS. And once you incise basically and found the interval of the gluteus and the, and the TFL, then you just are on the capsule. You make a capsular split as we see in here. And then you take out uh, the anterior parts of the capsule. This is what I'm doing here. And then you already have a great exposure of the hip joint. You now put your uh, retractors from extra, from, from extra to intracapsular. You externally rotate and do your femoral preliminary cut. And this is done in order to win space. Now, the bony parts, basically, they contract, contract and bring themselves apart each other so that you win space and the muscle is not under tension anymore. And then you have way more ability or more, way more options to put in retractors and work in that field. So now it's all being prepared for the definitive neck cut. As this neck cut is, uh, is performed, <clears throat> the femoral neck is harvested and we are uh, put the limb back to its neutral position and bring the femur back to the posterior side, remove the persisting head, and then we ream uh, the acetabulum. Now you put in the component. Well, that's it. It's, it's really not more than that. You ream the acetabulum and I take, um, I take press fit implants uh, for, for the acetabular side. And as you have done that, you go back to the femur again. And that's the, really the most, let's make a little break here, because that's the most difficult part of the whole procedure to make a release now that allows you to, to deliver the femur out of the depth and bring it to an orientation where you as a surgeon can safely insert um, the stem. And this is why the, why the incision is carried out in that direction because you bring the knee a little bit to the back, almost in elongation of this cut, of this incision that you, the skin incision, so that the femur sticks out to your wound direction. And then you open this canal as to be seen here and go with your uh, brooches, your reamers, broad handle reamers inside. And you see, I, I do this manually. I, for the for the initial uh, sizes, I don't even take uh, a mallet. And when I come to definitive sizes, I place it with a mallet. And when I have snug fit and the insertion height is appropriate, then I change to the definitive implant and make my trial reduction on the definitive implant. So you see this trial reduction now here, goes a plastic head on. 
<clears throat> there's the trial reduction, snaps in, nice fit. You need some, some, uh, some telescoping length of three millimeters, four millimeters, so that it's not too tight. And then you can test it, obviously, for all the ranges uh, in motion uh, in order to, uh, to get, a good stable, uh, get, a, get a good stable position. So then you exchange that to the definitive head length, and then you just go for routine wound closure. What we do is, and I think that's a very nice one, we uh, make, um, we don't staple it. I, I hate it because patients basically sleep on that side and that's painful. We, we love to perform this intracutaneous suture uh, and that is uh, self-resorbing so that after 10 days, the patients just take off their wound dressing and then it's done. So now looking at these components that we've put in, the right choice for that component. Well, is there one for all or is it patient specific? Patients sometimes ask, does it make sense to go for patient specific implants? Well, as a matter of fact, the, the function of that joint is quite simple. As we said, it's ball and socket. So I'm not a fan of patient specific implants for the hip. There is other demands that I have. Well, modern implants today now for 40 years almost are modular. So that's very important in order to have an answer to different orientations. You can, for example, have um, asymmetric liners if you want to change somewhat the position of the, of the cup that you inserted and you're not quite happy with that, then there is asymmetric liners. And on the other side, obviously, you need the option to have a more or less um, a longer head in order to win some space sometimes or to be shorter with a femoral neck. So these are the components that we, ha uh, that we have. And uh, I want to start off with the left one here, um, the resurfacing option. So why not resurfacing? Well, there is advantages, obviously, and uh, that is, it appears to be on the first glance quite, quite bone sparing. And in young patients, we want to have that. You have a big head, which is a very uh, big advantage in terms of being safe for dislocation. And in fact, it is bone sparing at the femur, but it's absolutely not bone sparing at the as a tabular site. In fact, here it's bone sacrificing as the head is quite big, and so therefore you need a big as the tabular cup. You have a big head, and that also means you have huge friction, and you have that friction in metal on metal implants. And you see, that was when the metal on metal issue came up, and the FDA announced this warning. Basically, all these implants, metal on metal, were somewhat withdrawn from the market because the companies fear their lawsuits on metal on metal issues and so on and so on. So the next thing is um, you have to perform this through a posterior approach. And the posterior approach naturally comes with a higher dislocation rate in comparison to the one uh, that I have described now. So, and if you just for the sake of a big head, win some safety in terms of dislocation, but lose it again on the functional side of the approach, that doesn't really make sense. So in fact, what we need is just a good approach to the hip and get proper access. And we've had that with standard stems, to be honest, and there was no problem with standard stems at all. So there is excellent long time results. We have a 20 year survivorship of 97% with a CLS. 97. So statistically, you cannot come higher, I guess, in the medical field. I mean, that's just perfect. So the only problem with this stem is it's, well, it's as revision friendly if you use it as an uncemented stem and the technique is very elaborated. The only thing is it does not fit to modern approaches. And we want to use these modern approaches as they are the only ones that are muscle sparing. So if you want to be muscle sparing, then you need to go for modern stems, and these are the so-called short stems, not necessarily myotype stems, but short stems with the shoulder and uh, the opportunity to rather sneak around the corner uh, at, the, at the calca of the femur from the medial side in order to spare the trochanteric area. So it's easy insertion there. They are anatomically shaped and potentially there is a little fewer bone loss. But in fact, in fact, when we are really honest, let's go back to that image again, the so-called short stem in comparison to a straight stem, well, it's just this little shoulder that you have here and the length of the stem. 
that is different, but it's also the, the insertion process itself. And it's not the characteristics of the stem that bother me. As a matter of fact, the stem is perfect, as I described. It, it, it has 97% survivorship over 20 years. It's rather the ease of insertion that favors the modern short stems. So in fact, right now I'm using this one. It's a core hip from Braun. It's, uh, in fact, this is the long version of it. There is also a short one and it gives you answers to standard various and valgus sizes. It gives you one, uh, one REMA set for all the different uh, various valgus or standard uh, um, stems. And it gives you answers to all the angulations uh, and the lengths that you see here, but also it does not change the position shoulder of the prosthesis in relation to center of rotation for the head um, when you grow with a stem. So when you have to be bigger than your planning actually is, then most of the stems change in all dimensions. So this one and the fit more, they don't. They just grow to the side so you can grow with your stem quite safely. Keep your shoulder of the prosthesis as the height you want to have it in relation to your, to your tip of the greater trochee. And so you can measure this in millimeters during the surgery without any change of the position of the center of the head. A very big advantage of such a stem design. So looking into the cup side now, well, I told you that I use obviously this kind of cup, like a press fit, but there is also cups uh, with a screw mechanism. Th these are actually a good uh, second line of defense. If you cannot th bring these ones to hold, then that works quite well. But obviously, like in the good old fashion, you can also cement a PE cup uh, as a, as a um, kind of line of defense. That's also an option. These cups um, today come with a quite good uh, porous structure. Uh, they have a good grow in. They have a good primary fit. And uh, well, that's now such a patient after this procedure that we have just seen. And in fact, I, I'm allowed to show him. I, this one was the only one I have not asked whether I'm allowed to show it because that's my uncle. After his first hip, so we did the right side and that's at the evening of surgery. So um, he had the other one done uh, half a year later. So, but you see, the limitations that these patients have directly uh, after the surgery, and he was 75 when he had that one, um, are just little. So he is able to lift up the contralateral side, obviously the operated side, but also the contralateral side, and he can stand without crutches and lift up the contralateral side. And obviously such a patient has to be happy with that. So here's another patient. That's the planning. I always perform digital templated plannings. That's day one after surgery. So that's the same patient. Um, it's not running yet. That's the same patient. That's the x-ray. And you see uh, the cup is inside an angulation, which is appropriate. Uh, th this is the cup that I've, or the stem that I've just described. And that's the patient some three and a half weeks after the surgery. We can take a look at the incision. You see, it's not very long due to the fact that we make intracutaneous sutures. It's really quite nicely healed after just three and a half weeks. And you see, she's delighted. So going further, that's another one. <clears throat> it's the same. So patient standing up, uh, in this case, one day after the procedure. So I like to bring them up the, at, the, at the day of surgery, but latest at the day after the surgery, I want them to walk without crutches. And they do that. And uh, well, here you see it four weeks after the procedure in the outpatient clinics in my, in my department. So, um, but these are not unique cases. I mean, that works in 80% of my patients. So 80% of all the patients undergoing this kind of procedure can walk without crutches at either the day or the day after surgery. I think that's a massive difference. And I mean, for the patient uh, alone, the quality that you can stand up at the day of surgery and go to the loo makes a tremendous, tremendous difference. So in summary, Hippo A is very, very common. So and as it is very common, it's our duty as surgeons to treat it at an appropriate level. So there is 
there is in Germany alone 200,000 hip replacements every year. Amongst these, 80% uh, are treated through a hard hinge approach. That is 160,000. And we know that just because of the approach, 10% have a persisting limp after the procedure because you damage the, uh, the muscle or you damage the nerve that basically innervates the muscle. So 10% of 160,000 is 16,000 patients in Germany alone every year with a limp after a hip replacement surgery just because of the approach. This is completely unacceptable. So diagnostics, well, mostly an x-ray is enough. I think it's a very important point because uh, patients are being sent to us with uh, very, very expensive diagnostics. We have MRI scans from everything, like uh, every, every six months, patients come with new MRI scans and ask about their hip. It's completely unimportant and we don't need that. It just burns money. Um, the treatment obviously, as described, follows the stages of osteoarthritis. Um, but total hip, in fact, is uh, total hip um, arthroplasty is, is the treatment of choice and, and full thickness defects. And there is absolutely no doubt. And there is no alternative pathways in full thickness defects up till now. We, I don't know what there might be and what there is going to be to come, but up till now, that's the pathway we have to choose. Um, well, the implants should fit to the procedure. Well, obviously, um, there are implants that rather are dedicated for defects. Uh, the, uh, you cannot use a short stem in this and that scenario and so on and so on. So this goes rather deeper into detail and we need to speak about that point uh, when you come on a visit. And uh, modern approaches deliver, as you have seen, rapid recovery. Only anterior interval approaches are muscle sparing. So there's just a truly amus enter a minimally invasive surgery approach, mostly carried out on a traction table. I never understood why you should use a traction table and completely rule out your feeling as a surgeon uh, when, you, when you try to assess the stability and the, and the tension in a, in a joint, or you use a OCM approach. So these are the, the both options that you have. So if you, want to see any of our techniques, not only uh, regards hip arthroplasty, or, or, I mean, of course, you're very welcome to take a look at that, but we have our practice here and we have seen that already in the London Clinic. Lots of interesting guys there and we uh, introduced them all to you already to us sitting here uh, waiting for your questions. And uh, well, we love to work there, do complex osteotomy, do, uh, do good hip and knee surgery, and that's just the goal that we have there. So whenever you want to take a look at that, feel very uh, invited and give us a ring so that we can organize things. So that I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Christian. That was a absolutely um, outstanding talk. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I mean, I've seen you do this um, approach uh, like several times now, and, and you know, it still astounds me the exposure you get through that small incision that you make. Um, um, so we'll just, if anyone's got any questions, um, please put them in the chat now, um, and we can we can put them to Christian. But I'll I'll kick off with one if that's okay, Christian. Then. Chris, the biggest fear most people have is related around dislocation. That's, you know, comes from patients, physiotherapists, surgeons, and everybody. And, you know, it's astounding to hear that you've had no dislocations with this approach. What is it that you, uh, about this approach and your technique that differentiates from all the other approaches where dislocation is a problem? So a couple of things that may lead to dislocation. So one thing that, uh, that leads to dislocation is obviously uh, the position of the, of the cup. So you need to have an appropriate position of the cup. There is no approach uh, like this one uh, with, a, with such an easy detection of the transverse ligament so that you are very sure that the orientation of the cup is appropriate. I, I would not say perfect in each and every case, but it's really a difference whether you're off five degrees or 15 degrees. So that's first it had very important. The position of the acetabular cup through this approach is very, very easy or straightforward. Easy, nothing is easy in surgery, but it's straightforward. And, um, 
And the next thing is you're not going to touch the posterior capsule at all. And this is usually the direction of dislocation in hip arthroplasty. So uh, you don't touch it at all. And as it remains safe and not touched, well, it doesn't give you a breakout option. So in the last thing, you don't touch the muscles at all and they pull it all together. So basically on all three aspects, all three aspects uh, of dislocation in relation to what you have when you go for a standard posterior approach, which was quite common in the UK and is up till today. So when you come from posterior, then you have to insert your cup from posterior. So the position of the cup is rather pointing backwards. In fact, a normal hip points anteriorly. So what you sometimes reach is a good zero, but even that is not enough to maintain it stable. So the next thing uh, that you have is you go through the posterior capsule. So you have to reconstruct it. And we all know, of course, you may say, well, I do it in each and every case, but sometimes it's just not perfect. If you don't touch it at all, you don't have to reconstruct it. The next thing is you don't detach any muscle in the posterior aspects. You have to do that. You have to, you have to detach all the posterior um, external rotators. So, Obviously, you suture them back, but as I said already before, uh, a surgeon will not induce healing. We can look for the morphology. And so therefore, when you go for posterior hip reconstructions, you have to say that there is a higher dislocation rate and that's inherent to the whole thing. It's basically part of the approach. Christian, um, uh, why do you think there hasn't been higher adoption of of anterior and anterolateral approaches. There are so many obvious advantages. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there is, uh, well, there is, I guess, uh, only one reason which comes into my mind quite quickly, and that is uh, the common practice that surgeons have. So it's, it's basically routine training. It's not even that this approach is more difficult. If you would be learning this one off scratch right up front from the start, if that would be your training approach, you would be very familiar with that. And in fact, I tell you, it's quicker, easier, more, real, more reliable, all that uh, you, you buy in. But what you don't have is if everyone around you in your surgical environment performs different approaches and you have learned it uh, in a different way, then it's, it, it means quite some effort to relearn. And uh, especially when you, are, uh, when you are aging in your practice and you say, well, I've done that now for 20 years and, and that works for me. As a matter of fact, let's be honest, hip arthroplasty is very successful surgery. So even with a poor technique, rotten implant positioning and crappy approaches, you will have a result uh, of 90% satisfaction rate. So my, if this is now what we are facing, that we have to convince um, our colleagues that for the last 5% of satisfaction, they have to work harder, relearn everything uh, just for the sake of their patients. Well, and sometimes that's kind of a distraction that we see. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting through, through my career, when I was first starting the hard hardinge approach, the lateral mm -hmm. approach, and modified uh, because we weren't doing a trochanteric osteotomy. We were just going through the soft tissue. That was 80%. That was what everyone was doing. And then towards, uh, I suppose, by about late 90s, um, in, towards the end of my training, people started to shift to the posterior approach. And that's been the workhorse for the last 20 years. So I should imagine as rags was coming through, probably all you saw rags was, was posterior approach. Um, because Absolutely. it became the, 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 the kind of main way of doing it. So we, even in my career, I've seen this shift from the back, from the side to the back. And I'm sure given what, what you've shown and what we've seen ourselves and, and, uh, and for all the reasons that you've stipulated in the talk, I'm sure there'll be a shift to the front. Why is it that it takes so long to set up for the true anti approach? Why do people say it takes an hour to set the patient up? What's that all about? Well, the, the true anterior approach is usually operated on a traction table. So the whole oh, right. positioning uh, of, the, of the patient is, is way more difficult. And to, to be honest, it's, it's not that. It's, it's also, the, it's also the, the tools that you need are completely different. So, I mean, uh, if, you need to, uh, 
if you need to persuade your general hospital manager to invest into a distraction device for i don't know 80,000 quid uh, before you start with the with the first earnings uh, undergoing uh, a learning curve, which may lead to uh, massive figures of uh, of revision surgeries over the next couple of weeks. Well, that's not a charming situation. No one likes to have that. No one wants to do that. And so, therefore, yeah. uh, possibly it's it's not it's just not done. So this is why you stick to posterior approaches. Basically, I have to say that this is you, you see that on the surgical field, you have already. Uh, um, pre-performed uh, uh, the political swing that we have today. I would say uh, it, when you started with Hardinge, you have been closer to Europe because that's what's performed there. And posterior approaches, there you see the medical influences of the United States in, uh, in the UK. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, that's the typical approach from, from the United States. So everyone is performing, or 80% are, are posterior approaches there. Christian, we just got a couple of questions from um, uh, from the participants. Uh, the one question is uh, the components you use, whether you use ceramic or poly. And then the second question is, um, how do you ensure the leg lengths are equal? Yeah. So um, ceramic or poly, uh, well, I, I could say I could say uh, both because it's it's polyethylene at the as the liner is polyethylene. You can with this implant that I'm using also use a, a, a ceramic liner. I don't I don't do that in routine cases and even in young patients I don't tend to do that because you uh, sometimes have this squeaking. I mean in newer uh, ceramic uh, implants that's also I guess something from the past but I don't want to revise uh, my patients because they come back to me and say, well, uh, I need some, some uh, uh, sound engineering. So uh, that really does, doesn't make, make fun, I guess. So, and in fact, we, we see that uh, modern liners, uh, as I said, we made some advantages in terms of tribology and materials. So modern liners, if you put them in an appropriate position, meaning 40 degrees of inclination, um, nice, nice fit above the head. So then they last 30, 40 years or longer. So there is, there is no high wear rates in, in, uh, in poly liners. And the head, well, I use ceramic and not, and not metal. Well, initially I started with that because I, I thought it's, it's of more value. In fact, it's, um, it, it, it seemed to me more modern, very sophisticated. In fact, that's of course complete uh, bullshit. You don't have to do that for that reason, but you have to do it for one reason now. And this is why I love to have it, uh, why this is my common practice, uh, is because more and more people approach you with allergies. And uh, whenever patients come back and they have a little complaint and they ask me about, well, do I have, do I have a uh, nickel inside my hip? I can, I can say, no, you, you haven't. Everything is fine. It's ceramic, it's poly, it's titanium, and that's it. And we, and we also know from the National Joint Registry, don't we, Christian, that actually, if you look at the data comparing ceramic on ceramic and then comparing ceramic on poly, that ceramic on poly has got really good outcomes and it's yeah, sort yeah, of, it's, in it's, terms of surpassing the ceramic on ceramics. Yeah, I, I, would, say, I would say that's the, the, the gold standard. I, I, I tell my patients that <clears throat> that may not be a Rolls Royce, uh, uh, but it's a Mercedes and uh, that sometimes is good enough to get you through. And finally, Christian, uh, I, think, I think we'll sort of finish off after this. Uh, regarding leg lengths, obviously people are concerned. Yeah, about very, leg uh, sorry, I forgot about that question. So no, that's a sorry. very important one. So this is uh, where planning comes into play. So as an osteotomy, it's absolutely mandatory from my perspective to get a proper deep pelvic view with a, a calibrated uh, X-ray uh, that, where you can put your, your um, your templates on, and then defy at which insertion height uh, your stem uh, has, has basically to be at the end of surgery. And you can measure this in millimeters from the tip of the greater trope. So, and this is what we do in each and every case. And obviously you can be off from this measurement by two, three, four millimeters, but never in dimensions of centimeters. 
And if you're off by three, four, five millimeters, and then you still have the option to use your feel as you don't have the patient in a, in a traction device, then at the end, you can just put on a hat, uh, bring it back to, uh, to the normal, uh, uh, or relocate it, put it back in, the, in the, the, the ball in the socket, and then you feel by just, uh, as to, by, by just touching and, and, and pulling at the limb, uh, the, the telescoping that you have within the joint. So it gives you a good idea of the tension, the overall tension that you have. And you can be quite confident uh, when you measure it that the leg length is restored to what it is. As the acetabular cup is usually not what you change in terms of height and position. You can do this uh, uh, um, intentionally, um, but then you know what you do actually. So then you go there on purpose and, and uh, then you have to, have to just take an X-ray and check it during surgery. Brilliant. Adrian, was there anything else you wanted to do? Some sort of closing comments for us? Yeah, thanks, Rose. I mean, I think Christian, a great talk, a uh, really lovely run through. Um, thank you so much for putting all that effort in, even if it was in the wee hours of last night. Um, as, as Christian has said, you know, we're a teaching center for, um, uh, for um, surgeons and for physiotherapists and, and even for general practitioners who want to come and see what we're doing, um, both in our own hospital the Harley Street Specialist Hospital, also at the London Clinic and the Cromwell, uh, where we do our pediatrics. Um, and uh, we welcome you, so please get in touch. Uh, Rags has very kindly put up our information there. Have a look at what we do on social media and um, keep tuned in for further webinars. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rags, for putting it together. Really appreciate it. Rags, and thanks perfect. to the attendees. Thanks a lot. Thanks for all the effort. Thanks, guys. We'll see you all again in a couple of weeks. Bye now.